The human ear is capable of detecting frequencies on a good day, so just north of 20 kilohertz. So by Nyquist theorem, the first CDs sampled audio at 44 kilohertz in the digital domain. You need that 2x multiplication to be able to accurately regenerate a sine wave from a sampled signal. Um, but audio files don't stop at 44 kilohertz. They don't stop at 48 kilohertz or 96 kilohertz. They want 192 kilohertz to capture the true ambiance and sound stage and presence and a whole bunch of other mumbo jumbo that is completely unscientifically verifiable. But they insist on it because they have special ears. Us mortals don't have good ears. And what about people with fantastic eyes? Why are they capped in a world of 150 megahertz for analog video in sort of the HD 60p sort of world? Why can't they have one gigahertz bandwidth, I thought? You know, I really like building uh, solutions to problems that don't exist. So when I was designing this board, which actually has a purpose that I hopefully will share with you one day, um, I was designing this to perform up to one gigahertz. And much to my dismay, as I shared sort of in the last video, the signal path from here to here should be a flat frequency response up to one gigahertz. I saw a big dip at 500 megahertz. It turned out I'd made a 500 megahertz antenna and I was just radiating that energy out. That was a fix, that was easy to make. But I also saw this little sort of 350 megahertz, a couple of decibels um, spike or hump in the frequency response. And I couldn't work out why it was. Uh, after chatting with some folks at work, we thought it was the uh, capacitance of this switch IC capacitively loading the op amp and um, that resulting in um, that frequency, non-linear frequency response or non-flat frequency response. And I thought, okay, fine, whatever. It's 350 megahertz. It's higher than the frequencies I actually really care about. Let's give up on this one gigahertz bandwidth thing. It's not that important anyway. Uh, ignored it. Um, but as I started building out the rest of the board, that 350 megahertz bump bit me in the butt because there are square waves in video signals where you go from white to black. And those sharp edges have high frequency content. That's 350 megahertz. Uh, some of it, it rings in here and it creates oscillations that completely swamp out the low frequency stuff. So I had to work out uh, what was going on there. Again, the, the right answer would have been just to switch down to a lower speed op amp. If you read through Jim Williams' application note 47, um, fantastic, fantastic read. There's a lot of reasons why high frequency op amps are difficult to work with, but I don't have a deadline for, for making this board. So I made this board here where I've made the same schematic. Like if you looked at this in a schematic view, um, identical in multiple spots with a variety of different ways of um, routing the signals in different ways. I think I can do about 20 different tests here. And I decided to test it. I wanted to learn more. I wanted to see as close as I could get to, I don't know if you can read that, an ideal uh, response. This should be flat up to you know, just over a gigahertz. Um, so I built this, I've tested it, I've learned a bunch, and I'm gonna share some of that with you. So let's go over to the bench and have a look. Excuse the mess of wires, I promise it was really clean before I started futzing around. That's the way it tends to happen, I tend to clean up in between projects. Anyway, uh, we have a video text signal coming into this board, 1080p, 30 frames a second. Uh, coming in here, going out there, so coming into this channel and output there, terminated into 75 ohms. The yellow traces the input, the blue traces the output. Uh, the gain isn't quite unity for reasons, but that's not important right now. And my triggering is a little hair triggery. Let's see if I can get that a bit better. Um, anyway, you can see occasionally there are these little blips. It's, it's behaving a lot better <laughs> than it was before. But these blips that are happening here in the back porch that aren't happening in this signal. It's not so problematic when it happens in the back porch, but when it happens in the video field, uh, it ruins the video. But let's see if we can grab one and zoom in. All right, we've got one. Let's zoom on in. There it is. Let's bring out some cursors. and zoom in even more and let's measure that frequency so from that peak there to this peak here 347 megahertz 350 megahertz um, that is the bump in the frequency response that we're seeing on this little op amp here and when it gets set off 
it gets set off. Now, when I say bump, I should recognize that looking at it on the spectrum analyzer, which we'll look at in a sec, um, it's only a wee little bump, uh, but it's like 10 decibels. <laughs> That's a problem. So let's get set up on the spectrum analyzer and I'll show you the problem. This board is proving kind of handy for normal, normalizing out across, across various different cable connectors. Anyway, tracking generators on. Oh, normalize. All right, so we're calling this, this straight through board here, 75 ohm characteristic impedance, calling that flat. Now let's go into my test board over here. The one I was just showing you on the oscilloscope. Now we're spanning from, well, out to two gigahertz. That's a bit ambitious. This is a 1.7 gigahertz uh, gain bandwidth product op amp. So let's go to one gigahertz. It's only it's, it's a wee little peak. How bad could that be? Um, let's put a marker on it. Uh, we are plus 13 dB at around 350 megahertz. That's no bueno, no good. Um, you know, a flat frequency response should be plus or minus three decibels. Um, <laughs> we have 13 decibels. Uh, no wonder it's ringing. So let's get set up on another board on this guy here and see how good we can get it. I don't know if you can see in the blurry background, but that's a pretty flat line. Um, so what's happening in here that's not happening in that other board? Um, this op amp, the LMH6702, has a very specific set of layout instructions. It recommends that you use this tiny SOT package instead of the SOIC package so that the path lengths are smaller. As I mentioned in the previous video, it wants you to keep the feedback resistors in the feedback path on the back of the board to minimize the inductance from the traces going from uh, the op amp out to those resistors. Um, it requires what well, likes to have five decoupling caps. I did do some tests. I, I haven't saved that data, but removing the decoupling caps um, has an impact on the performance and it wants a cutout in the ground plane so there's not a lot of capacitive coupling or parasitic capacitance under the traces or under that feedback summing junction um, between the ground plane and those those other components. So here I've just got it really nice and neat and tight here. Um, and we have a flat frequency response. We're going out to, what does I say? One gigahertz over here. Let's have a look out. Let's go out to the two gigahertz. And yeah, it starts dropping off. Um, Oh, I am wrong button. Sorry, new toy. Haven't learned all the knobs yet. We start dropping off around what's this? 1.3 gigahertz. That's where we're down minus 10 dB. Down minus 3-ish dB. Around here at 970. Uh, I'm not focused on that. But hopefully you can see it. 970 megahertz. So it's performing really well. Why is this performing so well, whereas the other one isn't? Well, there were two theories. One theory um, was that this guy, this little switch, so it comes here from this op amp out to this uh, connector via a switch. One theory is that this switch has relatively high parasitic capacitance, around 12 puff, I think it was in the data sheet, 12 picofarad, should I say. Um, and that sort of made sense when we simulated um, that. It definitely caused a, a spike um, around that frequency. Um, but when I remove this and just put a, a bodge wire through this path, I still saw most of that hump there. So my theory was I have this long trace going down here to this connector and I've got the termination resistor, 75 ohms, down here. Uh, long trace, ground plane under it, there's creating capacitance, there's inductance, there's a bunch of stuff. And having this termination resistor at the end is probably nowhere near as good as having the termination resistor up top. So on back, I'll just turn the power off for a sec. Um, what I did on this board is I did, where's my pointy gone? Here's my pointy. I built another copy here. That's an identical copy of this circuit here. But where the output is, I have, let me see if I can zoom you in to actually be able to see this. Maybe get some better lighting for you. 
Um, where the output goes, I've got two paths it can go down by a little 0603 resistor or jumper. I either put a resistor here, which will shunt the output signal over a 0.635 millimeter trace. I think that's eh, a little under 50 ohms. It's just a random sort of trace length. Then it can either go through a sh uh, just a, a zero ohm resistor here, so going straight through, and I can put a capacitor here to simulate capacitive loading, or I can switch it over the other way and have either the resistor at the near point or at the far point. Um, I can go through the thick trace or the thin trace, and I can add capacitive loading to either of them. And I will probably put up on the screen right now um, what I saw. So here we are looking at um, the frequency response of what I'm calling the ideal um, layout. It's not completely flat. Here we have the plus and minus 3 dB bands. Um, my calibration of what 0 dB was was not super accurate. Um, there's also a little bodge in the ground plane, which we won't talk about because I'm very embarrassed by that. So let's ignore this little dip here. Let's ignore the wibble wobbles. It, it's pretty flat um, all the way out to a gigahertz in the ideal one. So that's what we're going to call good, at least good enough for what I know. Let's compare it against the original sort of layout in the board, which looked a little more like this. That's with the um, termination resistor uh, far away from the op amp. Let's have a look what happens with that thin 75 ohm trace near the op amp. And we've got the white trace here. It basically mirrors all the way up to, let's call it 500 megahertz, the ideal circuit. Then there's some other changes happening here, but it stays within that 3 dB range. It's not as good. Um, it's more bumpy than the green one, but it stays within 3 dB you know, all the way up to this gigahertz. So moving that termination resistor closer to the op amp is a good thing. Let's have a look now at the thick trace with the termination resistor far away. So this is definitely a non-impedance matched trace. And whoa, thick trace. There's no output capacitive uh, loading here. It's just a thick trace with a termination resistor far away. We have horrible performance north of 600 megahertz, and we have this big hump uh, coming up to, what, 12-ish uh, dB around uh, 400 megahertz. So a thick trace with a termination resistor far away really sucks for signal integrity. But let's move the termination resistor a little closer. These are not simulations, by the way. This is me just recording real data um, and just analyzing it on the computer. Here, again, thick trace termination resistor nearby, below 500 megahertz, it mirrors the ideal situation. Yeah, it gets more shitty uh, p past 500 megahertz, but it does not have that massive hump and it does not have that massive roll off north of 600 megahertz. So moving the termination resistor closer to the output of the op amp, regardless of the output trace impedance, is a good thing. All right, um, <laughs> I want to cut this video short. I want to save you from the other nine variants of this circuit board. I'll keep it, the message short and sweet. Having, having the output resistor really close to the output of the op amp, regardless of trace length and capacitive loading, is a good thing. Um, but you probably already knew that. And if you didn't know that, you could read it in the book. So why did I make this circuit? I think there's something to seeing how these weird effects that are not quite um, straightforward to rationalize about, uh, seeing them in an actual board and giving you some tangible feedback for how these things actually work is really valuable for me to learn. It's also a great way to waste time and spend a lot of time learning about RF engineering, which is something I never thought I'd be interested in. And I am interested in it, but I'm also interested in making analog video circuits. So I'm hopefully uh, out of this rabbit hole and will make my next video about doing something interesting with video. Although I've been reading a lot about RF mixers and um, I think they're interesting. Maybe there's another rabbit hole coming. Anyway, I um, hope this video was interesting for you. It's definitely an interesting process for me. This is how I like to learn. I'm happy to share it with all of you. And um, I'll see you all in the next one, rabbit hole or not. Have a good one. Bye.